Hello. We thank each of you for joining us on the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. Now, our efforts are for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ and glorifying our Creator and Sustainer. But let us pray before we get started with this sermon. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you will use our works in preparation for this Father's Day sermon so that fathers and families will be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to talk for just a few minutes about the great question and the plain answer. The great question and the plain answer. Our text is found in Acts chapter 16, verse 27 through 33. Acts, 20, Acts uh, chapter 16, verse 27 says, When the jailer woke and saw that the prison door was open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. So Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for light and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and his family. Now the story takes place in a Philippian jail. Paul and Silas had been praying and singing while other prisoners were listening. And they themselves were prisoners. The jailer was asleep and the prisoners, as I said, were listening, which teaches us that it's important to be doing what we're supposed to do at all times simply because we never know when the Lord may use our actions to convert non-believers to Christianity. It's difficult to see that in much of our going therefore as we are instructed, that we might be going to our next witnessing opportunity. Being always ready is highlighted and important in preparation for life and witnessing for Jesus. The jailer was asleep and was more than just a jailer. He was a father and a leader of his household. He understood that his role as father meant that he was uh, to be responsible as a leader of all who lived with him. History paints a clear picture that far too many males try to escape the responsibilities of fatherhood by staying clear of the connection of the household that includes those that they have fathered. Too often, we, say, we t uh, accept excuses as external problems or external uh, reasons are going on in our lives that cause us to not be able to stick it out with our family. Just as the earthquake that was a God-caused phenomena can easily be seen as a way for God to set free his servants. When I took a spiritual look at what had taken place, I had to wonder just who was God setting free? The jailer was a non-believer, and therefore he was in the bonds of the grips of sin. This now appears to be designed for his deliverance in more so than for the deliverance of Paul and Silas. 
when I opened my ears and my eyes to what was really taking place, I'm even more convinced that this was all about the jailer and not Paul and Silas. After the jailhouse rocked and the doors were open, the jailer sprang awake and is assured that the prisoners had not escaped. His first instinct was to think that they had escaped, so my life is in danger. Really, it seems like this jailer was saying to himself when he realized the jail doors was open, my life is not worth a plug nickel to me. This caused the jailer to decide that he had only one reasonable decision to make and he prepared to follow through. He drew his sword, drew it back, and was ready to bring it down and ceased his life. He determined to take his own life before his superiors killed him for allowing the prisoners to escape. Now the prisoners assured the jailer that they are all there and killing himself was not necessary. He was more uh, interesting now in living than dying. He asked this of Paul and Silas, who were his prisoners, the question of the ages. What must I do to be saved? Yes, that's the age old question that many non-believers have asked. What must I do to be saved? When we can ask that question for ourselves, then we are opened immediately to the needs of more than just ourselves. Too often fathers in this life, this world, are more concerned about themselves than they are the, their families. And this has gone on for ages and ages. But the closer you get to Jesus Christ, the more we are required to ask ourselves and ask the question, what must I do to be saved? First of all, the question that we should all ask, two things come to mind as I think about this question. What must I do to be saved? The jailer had been relieved of his fear of the consequences of escaped prisoners. I believe that he had some idea of why Paul and Silas were in prison and no doubt they had been witnessing to him. And we never know when God has been working in the background to bring the one that is to deliver Christ and the one that is to receive Christ together. Too often we see it as just a quick decision being made. I'm wondering if these words that this jailer uttered had come up in the conversation by way of the verse found in Matthews chapter 10, verse 28, it says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. This man first was concerned about those that can destroy his body. And after his fear of losing his physical life had been resolved, now he's concerned about his soul. And he asks the question, what must I do to be saved? If he was in this day and time, maybe he would have been concerned about dying from 
the COVID-19 or in danger of dying at the hands of corrupt policemen. Either way, I think many more fathers should be asking the question, what must I do to be saved? But then there is a more serious need, and I'm I think this man realized it. If sin means separation from God and separation from God means as it assuredly does death, then I ask, are we in danger when we are separated from God by our sins? Now that brings me to the next point, the clear answer. The clear answer, the great question, and now the clear or plain answer. Paul's answer was simple and to the point. And when we witness, we must remember to keep it simple and to the point are precisely and clearly. Paul said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What did this poor heathen man know about the Lord Jesus Christ? Probably next to nothing. How could he believe upon him if he knew so little about him. Perhaps Paul and Silas used Romans chapter 10 verse 13 and 14 some way in their witnessing and assured him that for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then verse 14 says, but how are they to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to lead them to Jesus? No doubt Paul and Silas told him of the salvific gift of grace given on Calvary so that they and this man and his household could have everlasting life. Now, the last thing. We pointed out the great question, the simple or plain or clear answer that answers the great question. Now the last thing to consider, the blessing that was received. It's not something that only that jailer and his family could receive, but it was a blessing that all mankind could receive. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, and I'm amazed at who all are included in the world. There's a lot of folks that we look down on, don't have time for, that we feel that we're too good to share a word of Christ to. Prostitutes, homongers, robbers and thieves, murderers, all kinds of lowlifes as we would look at them are included in that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believe in him should not perish but shall have everlasting life. This jailer about whom we have been speaking was a heathen when the sun set. but he was a Christian when the sun rose. How quickly can Jesus turn our lives around and make us brand new? They that are in Christ 
are new creatures. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are brand new. This jailer, he laid down as a sinner, a heathen, but he rose that earth that morning, a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. This jailer was faced with a decision that he had to make right then. In, in other words, even though the Lord most likely had been working with him over a period of time, there comes a time when the Lord says, now is your time to make a decision. Perhaps there's somebody listening to this little sermon that have not made the decision to make Jesus your Lord and Savior Maybe the Lord is saying, now is your time. This jailer had to accept Jesus as his Savior and his Lord. He did not say as King Agrippa had, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. This man made probably the greatest decision he had ever made. And he chose rightly and quickly. He accepted Jesus and convinced his family of the importance of making the right choice about Jesus. And so he and all his household were baptized. Fathers must be able to make life-changing decisions for themselves and for their families. Fathers must always have their family's best interest at heart. I remember during my foolish days before I was converted, I had two close friends. And to me, it seemed like they made quick decisions in life. I thought all of a sudden, one day we were hanging out, one night we were hanging out, and the next day they, their lives were totally changed. They had turned around. And it was after I went through that same ordeal and I realized that the Lord had been working on me over some years to prepare me to make that decision, to make Jesus my only choice. And so often we want to have two or three choices in life. It was then that I realized that what looked like a quick and rash decision to me, it was not because my friends like I had had contemplated for a while, but only at that last moment reached a conclusion. As fathers, we are faced with many life-altering decisions, but none as important as deciding to give in to Jesus. Friday afternoon, my oldest son said, that I was his role model. I'm an old man, 67 years old, 67 years young. My oldest son is 45 years old and he feels that I'm his role model. Every father should make decisions that cause your children to look up to you, even if they're taller than you. I've always said about my boys, both of them are taller than I am, that they look up to me and I look down at them because they're, I, I look up at them and they look up to me. That's the way I say it is. I look up at them and they look up to me.
We must live in such a way before our families that they will trust us to make decisions that they can follow in life. Let them know that the price is worth making to follow Jesus because he paid it all for each of us on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary on a skull-shaped hill. They also called it Golgotha. He died in our places so that we could live free of the penalty of sin. They buried him. And the third day after they buried him, he rose again from the dead with all power in heaven and in earth in his hand. This father that was a jailer put his trust in the works of Jesus on Calvary. And Jesus brought him and his family out of the world into his heavenly family. The great question and the plain answer. If you are a believer, be listening attentively for someone to cry out with that great question, what must I do to be saved? And be prepared to tell them, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for always having someone in the right place to hear a sinner's cry when they cry out for help. Someone who is able to present Jesus to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, that's it for this week. Have a great Father's Day to all and to all. See you next week.